borrow your pen a minute. I'll try not to steal it.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hallelujah. Hey, we can do better than that. Yeah. <laughs> Lord, right now, we just want to come and invite your Holy Spirit into this place. Now, the crowd may be off a little bit. There may be some folks home. Not able to make it here today. We're not affected by that. The Holy Spirit, He's right there with you if you're at home or you're here. His presence is everywhere. So my prayer today is if you're at home and you're battling something, or if you're here, the Holy Spirit is right there with you. I would encourage you just to reach out and say, Lord, strengthen me. Strengthen me through your Holy Spirit. Give me the words, Lord. Give me wisdom. You know, I'm praying for wisdom. We need to be praying for wisdom during these days we're living. Give us wisdom, Lord. Give us signs. Give us wonders. Give us eyes to see. Lord, your Holy Spirit is welcome in this place. Yeah.
search the world But it couldn't feel me Some things come up this morning. We got a phone call and that uh, had some guys that weren't feeling well for the worship team. And so 
uh, we thought we'd try to tap into Trinity Fellowship, and I'm so thankful for them. Tr Trinity is our mother church, and that's who uh, they were very instrumental in, in the river ministry being here in Canadian. And so I'm very thankful for Pastor Andy Taylor over there. And the worship leader there was Mark Simpson. Great guy, great. I mean, I, it's been fun to watch Mark over the years and to, to develop into who he is. And you know what? That's what's fun about the presence of God is watching people's lives change. And you know, and I know that that's something that God's called us to do. And so uh, I know under the little caption there, it said Trinity Fellowship and all that. And that is our mother church. But you're at the River Ministries, in case y'all didn't know that. So just, <laughs> but so I'm thankful that we was able to do that. I got a lot to be thankful for. I know I've been, been out for the last couple of weeks. Uh, we had our wow women, the women of worship, uh, set in as a worship team for the last couple of weeks. And, uh, they shared with us through words and also shared, uh, Jamie Baker came and shared with us as well. And so I'm very thankful for, to have men and women around me that can just step up and do whatever it takes. And so I appreciate Elizabeth being able to tap in to Trinity there this morning. Now, I texted Andy right before services started here, and I told him, I said, Andy, I said, we're tapping into y'all's worship today uh, so that we can do this. And he texted me back, and he says, uh, both our projectors are down today. He says, it ain't going to work. So that was actually last week's worship service that we watched right there. And so, and but very appropriate. I, I love it. I love the message of it. And so... Uh, I do have some things that I feel like I want to share with you here today. And, uh, I want to do something before I really get started off into this. And I'm going to probably ask Sherry to come help me with part of this in just a minute because we go back every morning before our service and we, we go and share with each other. And we, one of the things that we do, and we're just sort of accustomed to it, what's the Lord telling you? You know what, that's the most important thing that you can ever get in your life is to know what God is telling you personally. Because it, that's the kind of God who, who He is. And so one of the things that I began to share uh, with Sherry this morning, and and we were fixing to pray for an individual this morning, and, and the words came, and I... I started to, I started speaking and I told Sherry I wanted to pray for him. And, and before I got these words out, Sherry's saying some of the exact same words I wanted to say. And so, and, and, it, and one of them was about rebuking thoughts, rebuking things that we know do not come from him, but not just rebuking those thoughts. Cause there's times in my life, have you ever had a dream that you knew was not from God and didn't belong to you? And you know what? I do that quite often, and I, or not just dreams, but have thoughts come against me, or thoughts that come and, and, and negative things. And immediately, I have been very adamant about rebuking those thoughts and rebuking those those uh, dreams, even in Jesus' name. But then I found a conviction in my life about what am I filling up that void now in my life? And so, Sherry, you want to say something to that? Or not? Go on. Sure. All right. But there's just some things that we've got to do that we've got to feel the word. Uh, we've got to take the word of God and fill those voids in our lives. Now, if I if I rebuke something, I cast it out in Jesus' name. Amen. Now there's a void. So what am I going to fill that up with? The word actually says that if you don't fill it up with the truth, then you will actually the enemy will return and he will be even seven times worse than he was before. That's right. yeah. So these are some things that we've got to be able to be uh, aware of and cautious of in our lives. And so I'm going to share some things with you here today that I believe are they're transformational. And you know what? They're, let, let me say this. If I take all the influence of this world and allow that to take root in my life, then I can honestly say that the depressions, the things that come against me are self-inflicted. And so I've got to recognize that Jesus came that I may have 
life and life to the full. Full means there's no void. And so as I come into that, I begin to look at this. And so that's where I come up with where I want to start into my notes here today. Matthew 6, 33 is a very quoted scripture. And it says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Now, everybody, most of the time you're going to hear those scriptures quoted and you're going to talk about, you know, the kingdom and you're going to talk about his righteousness and you're going to talk about what you can receive. And now those are all good, but I want you to take that word seek first. And what does that really mean to you? <clears throat> what does it mean to seek first? And you know what? And Sherry and I, again, we were talking back there this morning and, you know, and, and it's easy to get up in the morning and say, you know, say, man, Lord, what do you want to teach me today? What do you want to show me today? And we go about things and we've entered in to his presence. But then as we go through the day, we fall right back into the situations of life and the patterns of the world and not the patterns of the kingdom of God. So if I'm going to seek first his kingdom, this is what I wrote it down as. Okay, Lord, what do you want to do about this situation? I need to know first what he wants to do. What do you want to do about this situation and what's my part in it? To seek first means that I'm positioning myself to receive the wisdom of God, and then I make, then I live my life accordingly. And so I believe that that is vitally important. Now in John 14, verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The way, the truth, and the life. That's his identity. That's who he said he was. Now that's just a speck of who he is, but it's also a fullness of who he is. And so he is the way, the truth, and the life. And you know what? He's invited me into that. He's invited me into the way, the truth, and the life. It's my choice to choose him. I want to ask you, is there anybody in here that has accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior? Amen. Amen. And you know what? When you do that, you enter into something. You, you have entered into something. And let me put it this way. It's bigger than you are. It's bigger than you are. And so as we do this, it's, <clears throat> it's my choice. And now I make it a priority in my life. And you know what? That's something I'm still working on at times. Because there's times it's easier to fall into the patterns of the world than it is to make Christ's words a priority in my life. And so it's my choice and priority to follow the way in order to receive the truth. When you receive truth, what happens in your life? It brings freedom. And so he said... so. It's my choice and priority to follow the way to receive the truth for my life. God sets you up to be victorious in every situation of life. Do you know what a Proverbs is? What does Proverbs even mean? The word proverb. This, this began to come to me and I began to see some things and so... I looked it up on Google. And you know what I found on Google? It simply said, it says, it is a general truth or piece of advice. And I, that's pretty lame to me. I mean, so I, I wanted to know. And so I was asking, Lord, what is this? And he said, and he began to remind me that there's 31 Proverbs in his word. In the book of Proverbs, there's 31 of them. And so I began to think about that and, you know, and I wanted to know, I said, okay, I see this definition that Google gives me, but I want to know what the definition of a biblical proverb is. 
And so what is a biblical proverb? I wrote it out like this. It says a biblical proverbs are God's wisdom that raise the values, the moral conduct and behavior and the meaning of life into his righteousness. Remember, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. So if I look at this, is she writing that up again? I never know what she's putting up behind me. I do need to get that other projector pick. But it said, these <clears throat> Proverbs is God's wisdom that raises the value of your life. Do you want to raise the, do you want to increase in your life? He's telling us how to do this, how to get a hold of this, that we can see the increase to live a life of fullness that he has for us. He goes, so it raises the value, the values, but it raises the moral conduct. You know what? I don't act as bad as I used to. And I still am a work in progress, though. So. And we don't need any testimonies of that right now. But it raises my behavior to be more like him, to be more like his son. It also, it gives me more meaning in my life. When I take the Proverbs, the biblical Proverbs, and apply them into my life, it changes me. And then, you know what happens? The transformation that happens, I actually become a light in a dark world. Today is October the 18th. I turn to Proverbs 18. And I just want to look at these first two scriptures right here. And just listen. You want to know what the Lord says that will elevate you in your life? I believe that this is it. Just these first couple of verses. We could go on and on, but I'll just stay with these two. And it says, An unfriendly man pursues selfish ends. He defiles all sound judgment. You know what I get out of that? Selfishness is a killer. God didn't call us to be selfish. Your relationship with Him is not just for you. Remember, He, he created you to be salt and light in a dark world. What does salt do? You know, many times I've, <clears throat> I've even talked this like this before about how salt is a preservative and all that. And it is. But salt also adds flavor. And guess what? You're called and was created to add flavor in a dark world. So I'm looking for increase. All these things will be added unto you. I'm looking for a place of that I can not only receive, but give increase into somebody else's life. That tells me my words about somebody else or about a situation have life and death in them. And so as I see and look at this, that next verse, verse 2, it says, A fool finds no pleasure in understanding, but delights in airing his own opinion. Did you ever know somebody that was very, very opinionated? And their wisdom didn't come from God. Don't be naming names. But sometimes I got to look in the mirror and to see myself. Because my words have life and death in them. And so I need to recognize that if I, if I can see the faults in somebody else, I don't need to call out the false, but I do need to call out the truth that can set them free. John 7, verse 37, it says that, <clears throat> excuse me. On the last and great day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, if anyone is thirsty, are you hungry for truth? Do you really, do you really want to fill the voids that you have in your life? He tells us how to do it. 
It says that if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, the streams of living water will flow from within him. By this, he meant his spirit. I have noticed in my life at times that I have, I have opportunities to speak from the spirit of God into somebody else's life. But I've also noticed that sometimes it's been easier to speak from my own opinion or my own spirit and not the spirit of truth that brings freedom. And so again, I'm looking in that mirror and seeing who I really am. Am I who God created me to be? So as I look at this scripture, it says, by this he meant his spirit would be flowing. And it says, <clears throat> whom those who believe in him were later to receive. They had not received the spirit. It said up to that time, the spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. So you know what? If I want to glorify my heavenly father, I'm going to do it by speaking from the spirit of God. By speaking the spirit of truth. I'll show you some things as we go into this. But the Holy Spirit is in me as a river, not a lake. But the word as we just read here in the NIV, <clears throat> excuse me, and it depends on which scriptures or which translations you read. Some say rivers will flow from within you. Some say streams will flow from within you. I began to ponder that. And, you know, and I've, I've spoke against this and I've always wanted to quote it as rivers of living water. And I don't know exactly what was wrote in the Hebrew at that time or in the Greek at that time. But I do know that as an individual, I'm a stream. But corporately, we are a river. And it's because of who, who flows out of us. The Holy Spirit that flows out of us. And so I want, I can tell you this, and I believe we battled some of this in the past, is that in, in my own life, and I've seen it in the lives of others, that they begin to get to such a place that they try to become their own river. And that is not biblical. I don't have all the answers and I can tell you real quick. But I know the river that does. And you know what? I know that there's revelation that God gives me to give to other people. And that's a stream that flows from within me. But I also know that it gives you revelation to give to others as well. And so as we come together, you know what? I believe that this is the importance of church. God called us to be together. He ordained us to be a mighty river. And so I see that that's what this is, but that's not what I'm going to teach about there today. But the, the, let me put it this way. The Holy Spirit is bigger in me than I've allowed him to be flowing out of me. Now think about that. Let me say it this way. The Holy Spirit is bigger in you than you've been willing to let him be out of you. There's more to come. And that's in abundance. That's, that's the provisions of life that he's given us. And it's so, now let me ask you this. How deep is the stream of living water in your life? How deep is that stream of living water in your life? Is it a priority that you're sensitive to hearing the Father and seeking Him to hear the revelation that you can give to somebody else? That's what He's called us to do. That's that being that light and that salt that He's called us to be, adding that flavor to people's lives. You know what He didn't do? He didn't call us to be condemning. He didn't call us to be unforgiving. 
because that's not his nature. John chapter 3. When y'all hear the words John chapter 3, is there a certain scripture you think about? John 3.16. Well, that's very true. Probably the most quoted scripture in the Word of God. But I want to show you some things today because most people could not tell you what else is in John 3.16. They can quote John 3.16 and 17, but most don't know what the rest of this word says. So I want his word, the completeness of his word to be a priority in my life. And so I began to read through this and this. And I can tell you what I'm sharing with you today came because of conviction in my own life. And so it comes and it says, now there, <clears throat> now there was a man, starting at verse 1, John 3, 1. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. It says, a member of the Jewish ruling council, he came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who came from God. Now I want, I want to point out the word rabbi, do you know what that is? Sometimes we need to look at the words that are said and to know there's meanings in these words. And it, the word rabbi actually is a Jewish scholar or teacher. Now, who said that? It was one of the guys that was sitting in the Sanhedrin, one of the Jewish leaders, Nicodemus, and he's saying, hey, I recognize there's something different about you. And you know what? That's why it's so vitally important that we speak the way, the truth, and the life. Because people will recognize there's something different. And it goes on, it says, we know that you are a teacher who came from God, for no one could perform miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. Now, what was one of the promises that God gave you when you received him as your savior? That he would never, he would never leave you and he would never forsake you. Guess what? God's with you. I don't care where you're at. You may be where you're not supposed to be, but I guarantee you God's with you. And you need, and the more sensitive that we get to that, that's that seeking first. The more sensitive that we get to that, the more it's going to change our life. The more we're going to see the fulfillment of the life of Christ, not only in our lives, but also in the lives of others. And it says, in reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is what? Born again. Born again. Let me tell you something. To be born again does not mean you join the church. To be born again means there's been a transformation just happened in your life. <clears throat> you recognize that you are not just a citizen here in the United States, but you are a citizen in the kingdom of God. Now you recognize this as we go and it goes, it says, how can a man be born again? Nicodemus, uh, Nicodemus asked, he says, surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. I love the word truth. I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and spirit. This is something I have heard taught so many different ways. But Jesus is taking something natural to explain the spiritual. That's simple. Every one of you was born of water. Of the flesh is what the word actually says. But when you are born again, you are born of the spirit. And it goes on, it says, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. Now let me ask you something, are you born again? Why do I ask that question? Because it's the most important question you will ever answer in your life. And I can tell you this, why is it the most important question you'll ever ask in your life? Because heaven is real. 
but hell is real too. That's right. You should not be surprised to my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Let me tell you something. I can tell you that I am in a place today because the Spirit of God has led me to here. Now, everything along that path, I was not led by the Spirit. I was led by the pattern of the world in a lot of it. But God, when I accepted Him, never left me. He never forsook me. But His Spirit was there to guide me. But I want to go back even to a point before I was born again. When I was going to college, I saw myself as an individual that was scared to stand up and to talk to people. I did not have a very high self-esteem. I was at a point, my second year in college, my dad had died. And I was going down a path that I did not need to be going down. And in my speech class, I was studying to be an ag teacher. Well, let me put it this way. I went to school thinking I was going to be an ag teacher, but I really wasn't studying, if you know what I'm saying. But it came to the point to where they told me in my speech class that I was going to have to stand and give a talk before the entire assembly there at the school. My infinite wisdom, I dropped the class and got out of there. <laughs> because fear, a pattern of the world, I allowed to drive me. Now God, when there's a transformation that goes on in your life, He can take those spots in your life that you see as great weaknesses and He can be make them become strengths within your life. That's the transformation that goes on. Yes, it's true. It's hard to get me to shut up about this stuff now. But I fell in love with an individual. And it was Jesus. And you know what I found? It's something that continues to grow. But I've got to continue to seek Him. In the same pattern. Taking something natural as He did. My relationship with my wife, I love her more today than the day we got married. But I can tell you, there's been times the patterns of the world have tried to come between us. If you know what I'm saying. So I look into this word and I'm going, God, I need your truth. I need your truth in my marriage. I need your truth in those areas I see as weaknesses in my life. I need your truth in every aspect of my life that I can live and be who you created me to be. It goes, this word goes on, it says, we've got to be born of the Spirit. Verse 9, it says, how can this be, Nicodemus asked. And Jesus replied to him, he said, you are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and do you and you and do you not understand these things? In other words, he's supposed to be one of the spiritual leaders. But he's saying, You don't understand what I'm trying to tell you. And he goes on, he said, I tell you the truth. There it is again. I tell you the truth. You know what he's doing when he says, Jesus says, I tell you the truth. I'm going to give you a testimony about who I am. You get to know him better. You know what? The, the greatest thing that you can ever do is not to, to know Jesus, but the greatest thing that can ever happen is for Jesus to know you. Because remember, he said at the end, he said, there's going to be people that said, man, Jesus, did we not go and do all this stuff in your name? And he said, away from me, for I never knew you. You can't hide from him. You're Israel's teacher, 
Jesus said, and he says, and do you not understand these things? I tell you the truth. We speak what we know. Who is we? Jesus is standing there and he's talking. He said, we, we, who is we? Jesus never said anything that the Father didn't say. But get this, everything that Jesus has said and everything that the Father has said, the Holy Spirit also says to us. And it says, so we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept the testi- our testimony. I have spoken to you from earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak in heavenly things? I'm going to show you something here in just a minute. It says, no one has ever gone into the heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Now I want you to pull that up on the King James Version if you can. She's going to be ahead of me. I already had it marked and I changed my page. Verse 13, it says, this is the King James Version. And it says, and no man has ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of God, which is in heaven. Where was Jesus at that time when he was talking to Nicodemus? He was standing on the face of this earth. But he also, his testimony was that he was in heaven. Every miracle that Jesus performed, he did as a man, not as God. But it goes on, and and that's that's very important because what he's doing is he is showing us that he says, hey, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. So the Holy Spirit is bigger in me than I've allowed him to be flowing out of me. And so... Your word, let me, I'll just turn to this. In Ephesians chapter 2. In Ephesians chapter 2, at verse 4, it says, Because of His great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ Jesus when we were dead in our transgressions. You know what the transgressions are? The patterns of the world. I'll move on. It's the sins of the nature, the sinful nature. But it's these transgressions, it says, it is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realm in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace. It's more in there than you think. Expressed in kindness expressed in kindness to us in Christ Jesus. I want to throw this little quick word in there. When you share a testimony about your life, you do not have to tell people that God slapped you around to bring wisdom to you. Because He brings wisdom to you and that may bring conviction in your life, but God's not going to reach down and slap you. He's there to build you up, not to tear you down. Okay? That's a word for somebody, I believe. But it it says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourself. It is the gift of God. It's a gift of God. Not by works, so no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. Now, many people get hung up, right? Well, what are the good works? He created you to be add flavor to other people's lives. 
to help lead people out of darkness. But you don't have to call attention to the darkness. They can see it. They need to see the light. I could get caught up in this, but I'm going to go back into John. John 3, and verses 14. Wherever I'm at. Uh, 13. No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. And it says, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man lift, must be lifted up. This is a very, very important scripture that most people will bypass. Most people, I don't believe, know what this is actually telling us. So I turn back, and I didn't mark it, but I should have, in the book of Numbers, Numbers 21, and I just wanted to see exactly what this was referring to. And just taking this up, and it says, the people grew impatient as they had been let out. And it says, the people were growing impatient on the day, or on the way. On the way. And it says, they spoke against God and against Moses and said, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the desert? Now, it sort of sounds familiar a little bit to you. And it goes on, it says, in the desert, it says, there is no bread, there is no water, and we detest this miserable food. Guess what? They had positioned themselves to think about something of what they did not have instead of what they had. The God of all creation was leading them into something fresh and new, and they wanted to grow the whole way along. Have you ever found yourself in that position? Before I give a personal testimony, we're going to move on. It says, Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. Now let me tell you something. And, and uh, but let me go just a little bit further. It says, Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people, and many Israelites died. What I'm going to point out here is that when you look at that, and whenever you read in the Old Testament, it talks about where God sent these things and all these things happened that uh, caused death into a lot of people, you're going to find out, that you're going to hear people talk about God's wrath. The wrath of God coming down on people because of the way they acted. Because of the way that they were living their lives. Because of the sins that they, they tried to get into. Okay? I'm going to point something out here. The wrath of God was satisfied in Christ Jesus. The wrath of God was satisfied in Christ Jesus. Now, I say that to say this. God did not send the coronavirus to teach people a lesson. But it's killed many people. There's been things that have gone on. We've seen that throughout this thing, throughout this world about how things have gone on. And guess what? They begin to gripe at God about it. They fall right back into the patterns of the world. And so as I look at this, I just need to throw that in. It says, the people came to Moses and said, we sinned. When we spoke against the Lord and against you, pray that the Lord, you know what? They're asking somebody else to pray for them. I had a lady tell me the other day, I was visiting with her, and she had called and asked me, she said, man, Donald, she said, I want you to be praying about this because I know you got a hotline to God. And I said, well, I use that line a lot, but I said, mine's no different than yours. But it goes on and said, uh, we sinned against and spoke against God. It said, pray for us that the Lord will take the snake away from us. This is key. 
Well, take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, make the snakes, make a snake. Get a hold of this. Make a snake and put it on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at this, look at it and what? Live. This is important. He was the snake. And it goes on and says, So Moses made a bronze snake and put it on a pole. Then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, he lived. What is this telling us? Remember, this came was a reference from the book of John. You're seeing a prophecy fulfilled in Christ's life. Jesus, too, was raised on a cross, a stick. And he says, when anyone looks at him, they will live. We've been looking at the patterns of the world way too long. We've been wondering why God's not doing what we think he's supposed to do. And we forgot to recognize and look at him and see what he has done. And what he's continuing to do throughout the lives of people that are led by the Spirit of God. I hope that clarifies some things for some people. But in in the book of Romans, somebody should have marked all these in my book. Romans chapter 5, verse 9. Since we have now been justified by the blood. Are you born again? You've been justified. Your actions did not get you into the kingdom of God. Your actions will not hold your position in the kingdom of God. You are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. But faith is active. Faith is something that acts on truth. And it says, since we have been justified by the blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath? We're saved from God's wrath. And it says, through Him. For if when we were God's enemy, we were reconciled to Him through the death of His Son, so much more... Having been reconciled, shall we be saved through His life? Not only is this so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. What does that mean? You've been made right. And He's not going to take that position away from you. You have been born again if you've received Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Now, I ask you from the very beginning, and Sherry used real quick to quote out when you thought of John 3, you thought of John 3, 16. Here it is. And it says, For, for God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whoever believed in Him shall not perish. Period. Now, there's not a period there in that writing, though, is there? It says, but we'll have eternal life. Guess what? There is no end in the kingdom of God. There is no end. But there's always going to be increase. I don't know exactly what it's going to be like in heaven, but I believe it's a whole lot more sitting around playing a harp. I believe it's 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 going to. Be, I believe that we're going to continue to look into this word, because Jesus is the word. We're going to continue to look and to grow throughout all eternity about all, who He is and what He desires to do in our life. Guess what? When we breathe our last breath on the face of this earth, it's not the end. There's no period, but we live. Throughout all eternity. They call it eternal life. But remember this, there is an eternal death. Day. The word goes on here and it says, 
For he so loved the world that he sent his one and only Son, that whoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It said, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. You want to know what your purpose is in life? Right here it is. You're the salt and the light. You are the one that he chose for the word of God to become flesh. It goes on and said, whoever believes in him should not is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only son. Now that takes me back to the very thing about seeking first. Am I seeking the truth of God's word? Or do I just want to stand up here and give you sermons all the time? If I give you sermons, I am, I am in falsehood. But if I stand up here and give you some meat to chew on that will make your life better, then I've added flavor to your life. And that's what he's called us to do. But you know what? We had the opportunity at the chili deal yesterday, the fall foliage deal. Did y'all, y'all participate? Many of you? And you know what? It was a great time. I got to visit with a lot of people. And I'm going to say thank you to Teresa and to Dusty again, too. You were lifesavers. I mean, we got to sit, and each one of us got to visit with different people and things going on. And you know what we were doing? We were being salt and light. I love, I love it. So it says, light has not come into the world, but men love darkness instead of, instead, did I read that right? Yeah, instead of light, because their deeds were evil. Everyone, you know what it means, their deeds were evil? They still had the patterns of the world. That's where evil thoughts come from. The patterns of the world. The enemy that has influenced this place. Now, I want to... Oh, I'm having fun. I could keep going, but I better quit. Let me put it this way. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on you for a purpose. You turn to Isaiah 61 and you can begin to see that purpose that God has for you in your life. It goes on, you can turn to Psalms 103 and it begins to talk about it. It says, praise the Lord, O my soul, and all my inmost being. Praise His holy name. Guess what? Your life is an act of worship. John 4 talks about it. It says, true worshipers will worship Him in spirit and truth. And those are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. Your everyday actions... My everyday actions, my everyday words, your everyday words are an act of worship. But you need to know who you're worshiping. You're going to worship religion, the world, or you're going to worship God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There's life in one. And that's Him. Father, I, th I want to thank You. I want to thank You, Father, for giving me the opportunity to share Your Word and to, to the truth of Your Word. And so, Father, my prayer is that, Father, that Your Spirit will always be the teacher in every one of our lives. That, Father, we don't just take a sermon as the Gospel, but we take Your Word as the Gospel. But Father, I know that it's Your Word, You being the way, the truth, and the life that brings transformation into our lives. And You said that in the midst of that transformation, that whatever we do, we are to do it with all our heart as working for You. Father, I thank You that You've called us friends. You've called us children. But may it always be our heart that we continue to serve you in everything we do for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen. Thank you for listening in today and thank you for being here. And uh, I just want to say this. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, don't leave without Him.
Go forth in Jesus' name. Amen.